And I'm not saying I'm going to be cruel to progressives or try to deplatform progressives because, let's face it, I'm still a better person than they are. A few minutes later. You guys can spend your money however you want, but I, for one, don't really feel like supporting a brand that virtue signals to us about how wonderful it is when grandmothers help their cross-dressing sons into burlesque style lingerie with fishnet stockings. But at the same time, I will say that if any of you were on the fence about whether to boycott or not, this isn't the first ad like this that Sprite has actually put out. <laughs> This is a responsive video to a very old video by Lauren Chen. It's a video from 2019. And you're probably wondering, why am I responding to this now? It's because this video has withstood the test of time. I think it is still important today. And the reason I think that is because this video is full of conservative sonoluminescences. Now, what is a sonoluminescence? I'm sure most of you have heard the term filter bubble before. It's when you only engage with people who already agree with you. The ideas of your in-group get regurgitated over and over again, and any conflicting ideas get filtered out. Hence the term filter bubble. A sonoluminescence is a phenomenon in physics that makes the bubble shine brightly for everybody to see. There are certain arguments that make perfect sense as long as you're within the conservative bubble. But once you take one step outside of that, they fall apart instantly, therefore making it obvious that you were once within the bubble. So, are the liberal sonoluminescences? Of course there are. This video just happens to be about conservative ones, but in another video I might talk about the liberal ones too. In this video, she's talking about this sprite ad here. And you can see what her issue is going to be with it. You can see this is a pro-trans ad. I'm gonna talk about a book, The Righteous Mind by Jonathan Haidt. It's about how we form opinions, and specifically opinions about politics or morality in general. His idea is that we are not as rational as we think we are. It just seems that way to us. When we hear about an issue, we're not weighing the pros and cons. We're not weighing the different arguments. Rather what happens is that we get a certain trigger and that trigger tells us that something is wrong. And then we form arguments in order to explain that trigger to other people or to ourselves. He has multiple ways of proving this, but I think you can just feel it happen. He has example stories. For instance, a dog of a family gets run over by a car. The wife realizes that now they can save money for dinner. So instead of chicken that day, they have the dog. Can you feel this tinge of disgust? The singer tells you this is wrong. Now you can make an argument for why this is wrong. But the reason why you think it's wrong, it's because of that tinge. It's because of that emotion. Emotions come first. Reasoning comes second. If you're on the left and you hear a racist joke, you maybe feel the same thing happening. A thing of like, this is wrong. Now you can make an argument for why it's wrong. But before that, you get that deep feeling inside of you, that tinge of disgust. So why am I telling you all of this? I have a theory about modern conservatism that they get triggered by the groups that they would admit in the past, conservatives used to hate black people, gay people, and so on. Those triggers are still there. But today, they can't just say, I don't like these people anymore. They have to explain the triggers without saying, I don't like them. And why can't they say that? I believe they honestly do believe that racism, sexism, that all of these things are wrong. But our emotions sometimes are in conflict with our principles. So in 2019, the leading talking point on the right was, we don't hate trans people. We don't believe that they are the gender that they say they are, but we don't dislike them or anything. Today, she would just say, I don't like trans people in media, period. But in 2019, she couldn't say that. But the trigger is still there. This ad made her mad. Now that she is mad is not my conjecture. 
She actually says that she's mad about this. And some people might say, hey, that's still a win, though, because at least they're happy about a Sprite ad, and maybe that'll stick to them, right? Sprite, happy, that connection. The, the thing is, though, everyone else is confused. Confused and angry. Confangry. Everyone, I think, includes herself, so she is mad. But what is there in this ad that could make someone mad? There's just trans people in it. So if you're mad at this ad, you're mad at trans people. But she can't say, I am mad at trans people. Just seeing them makes me angry. So she has to come up with other arguments. Now that is just my theory of what happened. But I want you to watch the rest of the video with that in mind. Just seeing trans people made her angry. And she has to come up with arguments why trans people make her angry without saying trans people make me angry. And after that, look at the arguments that conservatives make today about groups that they can no longer say that they hate. Part 1. I don't want freedom, I want happiness. I'm going to skip the beginning part of the video because she just describes what she's seeing and we don't need that. But within that describing, she says something that I want to respond to. Anyway, a caption on the screen reads pride, what you feel when someone you love chooses to be free. And then it says, you're not alone. Again, really not a lot of products being mentioned here or any products at all, but I do quickly want to touch upon the idea that pride means letting someone you love be free or however they chose to word that. When it comes to freedom, don't get me wrong, I believe that freedom from government is a good thing, an important thing, even a human right. However, when it comes to freedom in social situations, eh, I'm really not as big of a fan. Now, before anyone freaks out, calm down. I'm not saying that the government should tell us what we can or cannot do socially. However, I also believe that just because we're free to do something doesn't mean we should. I mean, some people might say that you should be free to cheat on your wife, free to do a heck of a lot of drugs, free to sit around all day doing nothing, free to let your health go. Which, I mean, I, I guess that's a freedom, sure, but that's not what I want for the people I love. My biggest hope for them is to be healthy and happy and leading a productive life. And as adults, we know that doing whatever we want isn't always conducive to being happy, healthy, and productive. That's what I'm talking about when I say sonoluminescence. I don't want people to be free. I want people to be happy, healthy, and productive. This is something that within the conservative bubble, this makes perfect sense. But let's talk about the other part of her statement first. I don't want the government to tell us what we can and can't do, but I don't want freedom either. So there is something who can tell us what we can and can't do. Presumably her. I don't want the government to tell us what we can't do. I want to tell you what you can't do. Now that is unfortunately not a conservative sound of luminescence. You hear liberals say that all the time. And it shows that you don't actually value freedom, which, to be fair, she does admit. But it's a cop-out. What difference does it make whether the government takes your freedom away or whether someone else does it? The end result is that you don't have freedom. So it's a cop-out when the liberals say freedom of speech means the government can't take your freedom away. Why is it better if someone else does it? And now we get to the why she doesn't believe in freedom. I don't want people to be free. I want people to be happy. There is a widespread belief amongst conservatives that there's basically a rule book out there. Follow these simple rules and you will get a happy life. In the past, conservatives used to talk about statistics like married people are happier than unmarried people or that conservatives are happier than liberals, on average. But these days they don't do that anymore. Because for every stat that affirms the conservative lifestyle, there is also one that contradicts it. For instance, women who make careers are more happy, despite what they say. People with children are less happy. So these days they don't bother with statistics anymore. They just assume it to be true. And if you want people to make their own decisions, you're dooming them to misery. People who don't believe in freedom. It's always because of the underlying assumption that everybody else would be better off if they just stopped making their own decisions and just listened to you. 
the reason why freedom is important, freedom of speech and also freedom of lifestyle, is because nobody knows everything, and I don't know everything. If someone does something that I find stupid, it might be that they are stupid, but it also might be that they know something that I don't. Most importantly, when it comes to lifestyle, because your life is very complex, very complicated, and only you know everything that goes on in your life. On average, being married is better, but sometimes a bad marriage can destroy you. On average, having a job is better, but sometimes the job you have can destroy you. I would never change my sex, but just because I wouldn't do it, doesn't mean that I know better what's right for you. Now, I can't say anything about Lauren Chen in specific here, but in my experience, there are very few people who live a perfectly happy life and who always make the perfect decisions. But people like that still believe that they know everything better than everybody else. This doesn't deter them from wanting to take freedom away from other people. That's because life is so complicated that every time you make a wrong decision, you can always twist things into saying, no, it's not my fault. It's not that I didn't know everything, it's something else. For instance, one of the things that conservatives propagate is that you should get married early, as early as possible. Now, people who get married early are more likely to divorce. Now, if someone got married early, like right after high school, and then they would get divorced, and that they would be miserable because they were divorced. They would say, see, you shouldn't have been divorced. They're miserable because they're divorced, not because I gave bad advice. And by the way, I just realized something. Look at how long it took me to parse this one sentence. I want to talk about a rhetorical trick here. I call it taking something from the conclusion to the premise. Say we're in a debate. We want to build a train station in our town. You believe it's a good thing? I don't want a train station because I believe that trains cause earthquakes. Now, if I were to make an argument that trains cause earthquakes, I'm going to lose. I know in advance I can't win that. So what I do is I say, I believe the safety of our people is more important than the pet project of my opponent. I make it seem as if we both agree that trains cause earthquakes. And the reason my opponent wants to build a train station is because he thinks earthquakes aren't a big deal. We can have more earthquakes. Why would you mind? And she did the same thing here. And I believe she did it on purpose. If you were to argue that you know everything about how everybody becomes happy, healthy and successful and everybody would be better off, if they would just stop making their own decisions and just listen to you, you're going to lose that argument. So instead you say, I don't want people to be free, I want people to be happy. As if you and your opponent already agree with the proposition that there is this dichotomy between being free and being happy. And that everybody who is in favor of freedom just wants people to be miserable. If you know what it takes for everybody to be happy, you don't need to take people's freedoms away. People will come to you. Everybody follows what they believe makes them happy. And if you really know it better than everybody else, over time it will show. And over time, the people will come to you. But that doesn't happen. Nobody's perfectly happy, healthy and successful. Nobody makes all the correct decisions all the time. And that's why you can't argue that. Part two. I don't hate gay people, I hate politics. So now that I told you about this rhetorical trick, I think now you'll appreciate why I picked this video to respond to. In 2019, they were still arguing things that today they don't anymore. Those arguments have all failed. So with a lot of things, they just say, Okay, let's just move them from the conclusion to the premise. Let's just pretend everybody already agrees with that. 
For instance, why is everything that has gay people or trans people in it by definition political? She actually gives an argument for that. These days you never hear a conservative explain that. They just all take it as a given. And I know what some of you are thinking. Whoa, boycott? Isn't that a little extreme? Why are you so triggered just because there are gay and trans people in an ad? This doesn't need to be political. So they support gay and trans people. So what? You are absolutely kidding yourself if you don't think there's a political message in that ad. And you know what? I would love it if being gay or anything like that wasn't a political statement to be leveraged by corporations. But these activists have assured us time and time again that, hey, LGBT is a political identity. Identity. And although there are plenty of LGBT people out in the world who don't agree with that, don't believe that, odds are that Sprite absolutely does. Okay, there is a political message in that ad because activists have ensured us that LGBT is a political identity. Back in 2019, the talking point on the right was, we don't hate gay people, we just hate politics in our TV shows, or our ads in this case. The reason she gave, nothing was specific to the ad. Nothing was, this is depicting LGBT in a political way. It's political because LGBT just is a political identity. In other words, there is no non-political way to depict LGBT people. Now let me ask you this. If someone hates gay people, hates them with all their heart, and there is another person who hates politicians, hates them just as much as the first person hates gay people, but the way they define the word politician is that everybody who's gay is by definition a politician. What is the difference between the two? In practice, there is no difference. If everybody who's gay is by definition a politician, then people who hate politicians also hate gay people. And then she will say, well, I didn't make LGBT a political identity. The activists did. This brings me to something that I like to call the axiomatic lie of conservatism. What is an axiom? An axiom is something in mass or in other fields that you don't need to prove. You just said it at the start of the theory, and everything else blooms from that. And if you remove an axiom, you have to basically throw out an entire field of science. The axiomatic lie is that conservatives set up a double standard. Let's say, for instance, the double standard is based on race. They keep treating people differently based on race. And when there's backlash to that, the opponents are obviously going to talk about race because you made it the issue. And then they look at the backlash and say, the left makes everything about race. That's the axiomatic lie that all of a sudden the left just started talking about race, gender, sexual orientation in this case. But before the left started talking about it, everything was fine. It's something that they don't seem to need to prove. They just assume it to be true. But it's axiomatic. It's the basis for modern conservatism. If you take that away, you would basically have to throw out a lot of conservative theory. Maybe all of it today. Let's talk about why LGBT is a political issue. Let's talk about a video that Lauren Chen herself made, years later, about another gay person in media. And now I know this might not be a popular thing to say nowadays, but I actually, I do have a problem with Disney putting a same-sex kiss in one of their movies intended for children. And I know there are people out there who are going to say, why do you hate gay people? Uh, what's wrong with having a same-sex kiss in a film? How is that any less family-friendly than a straight kiss? But it's like, look, obviously heterosexual relationships are the norm, okay? And I'm not saying that to be uh, bigoted, but it's like by the numbers, it, it's true. There are way more straight couples than gay couples. And you're gonna have kids who are going to this movie who simply have not been exposed to a gay couple. And so just hearing that there's gonna be a gay kiss in this movie, I automatically knew that this is going to cause at least some parents out there to have a conversation with their kids that they may not have intended to have, or at least not at that point. 
So here, she does acknowledge there is a difference between a gay kiss and a straight kiss. There is a double standard here. But what reason does she give for the double standard? Is that straight people are normal? Without getting into this, the fact that straight people are the norm, that's not the activists doing. That has always been the case and probably has been more so the case in the past. So the reason she gives for the double standard has nothing to do with the activists. So even in the parallel universe where there is no LGBT activism, there is no left to make it a political issue, she would still want a double standard. Still, in that world, she wouldn't treat them equally. Going back to Jonathan Haidt, you make the conclusion first, and then you make arguments to justify that conclusion. The conclusion she always comes to is that gay people shouldn't be in media. Not in TV shows, not in movies, not in ads in this case. In 2019, the justification was because they made it political. Later on, it doesn't work anymore. You can't argue that this little kiss here, this tiny scene, is a political statement. So they move on to another argument. Of course, we have to have a double standard because being straight is the norm. But the idea that there should be a double standard, that we should treat straight people and gay people differently, that didn't originate in the left. That originated right here. That originated with conservatives. And she says, I would love it if gay wasn't a political thing. And you know what? I would love it if being gay or anything like that wasn't a political statement to be leveraged by corporations. Even if it wasn't, you still wouldn't treat them equally. You still would want them banned. Conservatives are right about one thing. If you keep making something the issue, for instance race, then the other side is going to respond talking about race because you made it the issue. If you treat people differently based on their sexual orientation, then the other side is going to talk about sexual orientation. And then you use the response to say, uh, why do they have to make it political? It's kind of like, say two people are competing for a promotion. And one of them, in order to get the promotion, makes up lies about the other person. They say they harass people. They say they stole from the company. Now later, all of these things are proven to be lies. So what do they do? They make the argument, well now we can't promote them because they have become too controversial. Because of the controversies that you started. The same thing happened here. They made arguments to treat gay people and straight people differently. All of those arguments failed. And when they failed, they say, well now we can't treat them equally because the issue has become too political. You are the ones who made it political. You are the ones who made LGBT a political identity. Part 3. I haven't proven that I'm right, but you haven't proven that I'm wrong. That means I'm right. You really think brands are spending all of this money just to appeal to 2% of the population? I don't think so. They are trying to appeal to the progressive population, all of them. They're sending a political message here to let the progressive people know that, hey, we're on your side. Okay, first of all, 2%. I remember a lot of conservative commentators, like Lauren Chen, complained that now 25% of children identify as trans. But I guess depending on what they need for the argument, it's either 2% or it's 20%. If you're worried about the fact that it's so cool now to be trans that people go through hormone therapy or surgeries just because they want to be part of the trend, I don't think they're going to mind trans people in an ad. And second of all, and this ties to the axiomatic lie, conservatives like to pretend that their ideas are the default. And if you deviate from them, that's because you have a political agenda. Maybe the other people who aren't part of the 2%, maybe not all of them go Ugh, when they see trans people. Maybe they can watch an ad without getting angry at them. No, unless you're part of the progressive population, you hate trans people just as much as she does, apparently. 
Did you notice the theme of trans individuals with parents in the commercial? Because I certainly did. We are living in an age where there are literal court battles happening over whether or not children can be pumped full of hormones. No, I don't think whoever made this ad is unaware of that reality, and I think there's a very real reason why parents and their trans children are featured so heavily in this godforsaken commercial. Or maybe the ad is not just there to appeal to the 2%, but to their parents too. That would be another way to view this, if you don't just see politics in anything trans. Maybe I'm overreacting here and you guys can let me know, but I for one am tired of the Overton window being shifted further and further left. Remember how mad people were at Home Depot when they found out that one of the founders supported Trump? Remember how mad people still are over Chick-fil-A for supporting Christian charities and the founder saying he believes in a traditional view of marriage? The left wants people to believe that those views supporting Trump and Christianity, those are outrageous, extreme, worthy of boycott, but trans everything? Well, that just makes sense. That's normal. That's the default position. That's what brands should be trying to embody, actually. No, no, I'm, I'm sorry. No, I'm not going to be part of that. There is an idea on the left that I hate. And until I saw this video, I thought conservatives were against the idea. The idea is that next to the laws we have, there is a second set of laws, social norms. Those things are legal. But if someone does those, we as a society have a responsibility to come together to make those people miserable. And we have to do it via ostracism. Getting them deplatformed, getting them fired, saying something racist, for example. It's legal, but if someone does say something racist, we have to punish them in a different way. And I thought conservatives were against that. I thought they were against cancel culture. She brings up these points about how the left cancels people. This would be a perfect opportunity to question the idea why we should have an Overton window in the first place. Why do we need to boycott brands at all? Why do we need to have this second set of laws? Conservatives are not against cancel culture. They just hate it when it happens to them. And these days I hear now the conservatives are boycotting like the left does. This was 2019. They were always trying to do this. They were always trying to boycott everything that they disagree with. It's just now people started listening to them. Back then those boycotts didn't work. So later they could forget that they did that and say the right doesn't cancel people. Not for a lack of trying. And by the way, if anybody says the platform is not that bad, boycotting is not that bad. Earlier in this video, she said that she doesn't value freedom. So that means if you have a choice between not doing something and not getting ostracized and doing something and getting ostracized, in her view, you can't call that choice freedom because the consequences of boycotts are so dire that you can't say you have the freedom to do something anymore. Part four, it's not politics when I do it. And I'm not saying I'm going to be cruel to progressives or try to deplatform progressives because let's face it, I'm still a better person than they are. Am I saying that I'm better than you? I guess I'm going a little further than you are. Yeah, I'm f better than you. Okay, much better than you. You are garbage. Okay, if you get a rise out of attacking the powerless, you're garbage. Now, I don't know if she does her own editing. But I like to think that this is her editor just trolling her. Conservatives complain all the time that liberals say they're better than them. But they do it themselves just as much and they don't even notice it. And why is she better than the liberals? Because she doesn't call for people to be deplatformed. This doesn't work anymore. You already called for the boycotts. So the reason you're better than them isn't valid anymore. Because practically, what's the difference between deplatforming and boycotting? The end result is the same. They can't express their opinion without being ostracized. But 
But at the same time, I will say that if any of you were on the fence about whether to boycott or not, this isn't the first ad like this that Sprite has actually put out. They've previously put out at least one other commercial in the You Are Not Alone series, touching upon gay and trans identities. See, Sprite has a history of making commercials that have nothing to do with Sprite, but have everything to do with progressivism. Remember this conservative trick? They set up a double standard, and if you don't adhere to their double standard, they say you have an agenda. This clip shows it. Now let's look at the other Sprite ad, but let's look at the entire Sprite ad. Let's not just look at the parts she cherry picked. This is not a pro-trans ad. It's about people who feel alone with their struggles. And some things that people struggle with, she would for sure emphasize with. For instance, not having sex before marriage, or not knowing what to do with their life. But because the ad also has trans people in it, it is now a pro-trans ad. This reminds me of the Coca-Cola ad. It showed people of different races singing together. And it also had white cowboys in it. So what did conservatives do? They removed the white cowboys, they edited them out, and said this is an anti-white ad. Earlier, Lauren Chen said, I am no longer willing to live and let live. But I'm just not willing to live and let live with this kind of thing. No, I I'm done with that. We have lost too much ground already. We need to do something. The message of this ad is live and let live. But it also says let trans people live. And you can't have that. But this shows the idea that you should have a double standard for trans people and for cis people. Not even a question of who's a real woman or who's a real man. Just in how you treat people. Just in telling people you are not alone. Just there you should have a double standard. And if you don't adhere to that double standard, if you actually treat people equally, they say you are making it political. Part 5. The entire world is my hometown. Ultimately though, what is this all going to mean for Sprite and their business going forward? Well, it should be noted that this ad originated in Argentina where apparently people are super, super progressive. So I'm sure Sprite sales in Argentina will do just fine. However, now that this ad has blown up on social media, they may be in for some trouble internationally. I'm going to play that again, in case you missed it. Well, it should be noted that this ad originated in Argentina where apparently people are super, super progressive. This ad aired in Argentina where, according to her, people are super, super progressive. Remember, before she said, the issue with the ad is not that she's against trans people. She's against the fact that this is a political message. And she even said, maybe she would support it if we weren't living in a polarized society. Maybe my reaction to this ad would be different if we weren't living in this crazy polarized world, but l let's face it, we are. The ad didn't air in a polarized society. The ad aired somewhere where people are already super progressive. But this is not controversial, according to her. That goes to show that she wasn't even looking at the politics. Let's go back to Jonathan Haidt. You see something that makes you angry, and then you come up with reasons to justify that anger. She didn't look what was the political message of that ad. She saw trans people, that made her angry, and the argument she came to was, this is political. But the ad aired somewhere where it wasn't political, where this wasn't controversial. So the whole entire argument against the ad doesn't work. It was always an excuse. They are making it political is always an excuse by the right to justify their bigotry against trans people to justify that you should never see them, nor should you empathize with them. Not even the you are not alone ad is okay. You shouldn't even treat them as friends. And that is the axiomatic lie of conservatism. 